It is my great honor and pleasure to introduce Dr. Mark Zafario. He's a head and neck surgeon and professor at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. Um, he's section chief of the head and neck endocrine surgery uh, and associate medical director of the head and neck center. His clinical practice focuses mostly on patients with thyroid cancer and parathyroid neoplasms. And he's also a super rock star and FICA medical advisor. So with that, take it away. Thank you, yeah. <laughs> That's uh, much too kind. Thank you so much for that uh, too kind introduction. Um, so um, it's been so wonderful to see so many of our patients here from uh, MD Anderson. And uh, not only our medullary thyroid cancer patients, but uh, several of our other kinds of thyroid cancers, um, papillary and anaplastic. And, and uh, so wonderful to see everybody doing so well for the most part. So I know it's not an easy journey for many of you and many of you continue to sort of live with cancer and that's not easy. Um, so uh, just to say that um, uh, you all are our heroes and uh, we uh, admire you and your, um, your effort and your fight and, uh, and uh, keep it up. Uh, and we're also here for you to, to, to help you through it. So, um, so with that, um, this is our, uh, our, some of our clinical team uh, at MD Anderson. Um, not all of it, but this was a recent retreat we had for advanced thyroid cancer. Um, so um, uh, I do have research funding for clinical trials from Merck and Eli Lilly. I'm actually not on the medical advisory board for Eli Lilly, but I do have research funding for clinical trials from both of these companies that goes not, not to me, but to MD Anderson where I work. So um, briefly, uh, give, to give a little bit of um, background about medullary thyroid cancer. So um, I don't have a slide about this because I'm assuming that most of the people here know a lot about medullary thyroid cancer, but, but uh, there are actually a couple people here that, who I recognize who do not have medullary thyroid cancer. So I'll just mention medullary thyroid cancer is one of the um, non-differentiated thyroid cancers. Um, it uh, probably makes up about 5% of uh, all thyroid cancer. You know, papillary cancer is making up about 80%. Follicular cancer is probably about 5%. Oncocytic about 5%. Medullary about 5%. And then anaplastic, of course, is, in, is, is probably 1% to 2%. So, um, and um, these can be either sporadic or uh, hereditary cancers. Most of them are sporadic. Um, and for the um, hereditary cancers, they tend to be autos autosomal dominant, uh, meaning that um, uh, if um, a parent has it, um, then there's a 50-50 chance that their child will have it. Um, and, but most of them are actually sporadic, about 75%. And they, um, these cancers are associated um, uh, with, spe with specific mutational profiles, which um, this has been an area of study you know, over the last decade or two in thyroid cancer and all types of thyroid cancer, um, you know, papillary, anaplastic, medullary, we're, we're learning a lot more about these cancers because of the mutational profiles. So certainly that is the case for medullary and we'll talk about that. So I'm actually on the guidelines committee for the new guidelines that we're actually working on now, but these are the, the old guidelines that were from 2015. And um, so I'm a surgeon, so I'm always asked to sort of say a few words about surgery for medullary thyroid cancer. My talk here is only going to be about 30 minutes, probably, and then we can um, we can we can ask questions because I know that's always a um, it's always an important part. And I don't know if the Zoom uh, will be able to ask questions. Um, they will. Okay, so that's great. So um, so for for um, for patients with medullary thyroid cancer, the traditional uh, you know, sort of thinking has been total thyroidectomy and central uh, lymph node dissection. So the central neck is the, is the lymph nodes right around the thyroid gland. They're, they're also called level six lymph nodes or central neck lymph nodes. You've got a right and a left, even though it's a, it's a central neck, there's a right central neck and a left central neck. So um, typically the surgery has been a total thyroidectomy and a bilateral central uh, lymph node dissection. That's what's in the guidelines, that's recommended. I do have to say though, there's growing sentiment um, in studies of unilateral surgery for, unilateral surgery meaning thyroid lobectomy. Let's say, you know, somebody has a small cancer on the left side and um, a med small medullary cancer on the left side and, and assuming that they're sporadic, 
medullary thyroid cancer, one of the things that um, is different, a little bit different between sporadic, meaning non-hereditary medullary thyroid cancer and hereditary uh, medullary thyroid cancer is that the hereditary are often multifocal um, because the, um, the mutations um, that uh, are um, causing the tumor are in every cell of the body. So you could imagine they're, they're in every cell of the thyroid. So that would give you more chance of having multiple tumors pop up in the thyroid gland if you have the hereditary type. If you have the sporadic type, they're usually unifocal, uh, only one site. So if you have a sporadic cancer, it's small. There is sort of some growing literature and study of, of thyroid lobectomy. And maybe, you know, if it's on the left side, left thyroid lobectomy, left central compartment dissection, so-called unilateral surgery for medullary thyroid cancer. And um, that's not the majority of patients, but um, that, that, that have that, especially, you know, in 2023. But there is, that is a reasonable strategy um, in certain populations of patients. Um, so just to mention that um, for patients, um, I mention this often, so those of you who've heard this, some of these points before in my talk, but, but for, for patients who have lateral neck um, metastasis at presentation, it's pretty straightforward that we resect the involved lateral neck compartments. Um, this is sort of a schematic of, of a patient's left neck a drawing, and these are sort of the different levels that we look at. This, these are just ways that surgeons describe the different levels of the neck. These um, levels 2A, 3, 4 are all along the jugular vein. And then level five is sort of back here in the, um, in the posterior lateral neck. Um, and uh, we typically resect these levels 2A, 3, 4, 5B. So for those of you who've had a, a lateral neck dissection for medullary thyroid cancer, that's often the, the levels that are um, dissected. And um, um, when we do this, we typically do have to, to dissect along this spinal accessory nerve here, which goes, you know, from the, basically it comes out of the, the, the skull base from the, uh, from the brain and goes into the uh, trapezius muscle there. So you can have some morbidity with that um, in terms of the, um, about 10% of patients can have some long-term uh, weakness of their trapezius muscle after that surgery, um, which can affect their ability to raise their arm above their head, you know, you know, brush your hair or um, things like that. So, um, so uh, that is something that we keep in mind with, with lateral neck dissections. It does add a bit to the surgery, um, but certainly um, lymph node metastasis and medullary thyroid cancer in the lateral neck are fairly common. Um, you know, a little over a third of patients are going to have them. That's less than that's less than what we see in in papillary thyroid cancer and differentiated uh, papillary thyroid cancer. So, um, so it is more common to do a lateral neck dissection for medullary cancer than for, for papillary cancer um, uh, because, the, because the medullary has more common and more extensive lymphatic spread um, than uh, papillary. So when we think about um, the lateral neck, um, when we think about papillary cancers, um, we don't do um, elective or prophylactic neck dissections for papillary cancers. Um, uh, well, for medullary cancers, it's still uh, a bit controversial. There's some, we don't have to go into the you know, fine details of this, but, but there's some older literature which sort of suggests that based on the calcitonin level at presentation, that, uh, that a lateral neck dissection can be considered. Um, so um, some of you here, I know, because um, I've talked to you over the years, have had you know, these lateral neck dissections, even when you didn't have lateral neck disease in your lateral neck, um, call it so-called an elective dissection just based on the calcitonin level. Um, I'd say that the general sentiment is shifting, uh, has shifted away from that in general um, over the years. Um, um, some of this data, um, this, is, um, this is relatively uh, uh, old data from 13 years ago from a, a German group, but um, a lot of the sort of um, data on calcitonin levels and where we start to see disease comes from, um, you know, uh, this, this group, this study, because they, they studied, um, I think this was uh, several hundred patients looking at um, basal calcitonin levels and looking at 
neck disease as well as distant disease. And so once you start to see calcitonin levels over 20 in the blue there is when you start to see the disease in the um, lymph nodes of the, um, of the ipsilateral neck, meaning the same side as the, the primary thyroid tumor. So, um, and then when you get over 200 in the green, you start to see, um, uh, you start to see it in the contralateral lateral neck. So on the other side, um, so that's, that was some of the justification of why some people have been more aggressive with lateral neck dissection um, in the past. Um, and it's still a little bit controversial, but, um, and then when you, when you see the red here, the 500 to 1000 basal calcitonin level, um, that's uh, often when you start to see distant metastasis. Not, not everybody who has a calcitonin of 500 or 1000 or even 1500 or 2000 has distant disease, but, um, but most people um, do. Um, uh, that's kind of when you start to see the, the, um, the distant disease. So, um, so um, and that's when you start looking for it in terms of you know, getting scans and you know, scans of the chest and the abdomen and bone scans and, and you know, MRIs of the spine and things like that that many of you have had. So um, we, we, we looked at this issue, it's been six, six seven years ago now, um, um, specifically whether or not to do a lateral neck dissection for patients who do not have disease in their lateral neck on imaging, on CT scans or ultrasound when they present. Um, and um, now th there is, um, I talked to, uh, to one gentleman in here before, uh, before the talk this morning and he's had a bilateral lateral neck dissection. He's actually done very well. Um, so it's great to see that, but there's, there's, you know, this is a paper that was published about six, seven years ago from, from a Canadian group. It basically shows a lot of sort of complications when you do bilateral lateral neck dissections from, for thyroid cancer, and this is at a high volume center. So it just goes to show that there are potential long-term issues with that. Um, so we wanted to sort of, um, provide further evidence to the, uh, to the medullary thyroid cancer community, particularly those um, surgeons who are high volume thyroid surgeons um, uh, about uh, what the data is when you observe the lateral neck, when you don't do um, lateral neck dissection for, uh, for uh, elective lateral neck dissection for thyroid cancer. And so we, we found simil similar biochemical cure, local regional disease, status, meaning their final status years later and distant metastasis survival, whether or not, you know, you did the lateral neck dissection or not. So, um, so we, we do um, recommend um, not doing a lateral neck dissection for, uh, it's not, it's not letting me move again. There we go. Not doing a lateral neck dissection for patients who don't have um, disease in their lateral neck that we know of. And it's because we see, you know, on the one hand, we see equivalence in all of these sort of factors that we can measure. And then there's some sort of downsides of it in terms of morbidity and, you know, time and cost. And um, there's not really a much downside in, in not doing a lateral neck up front because you can always go back and do it later. So um, one of the other things that's often mentioned um, uh, uh, as a surgeon, you know, uh, we as surgeons are often making decisions about not only the surgery for the neck disease, but if there's any other therapy that's recommended for neck disease. And so uh, one of the other things that historically has been done for patients with medullary thyroid cancer, because it often is a local regionally aggressive cancer, um, is, um, is historically, and I don't mean now, and we're going to show some of the data, but the, there's been um, more patients with medullary thyroid cancer who've gotten radiation therapy to their neck um, than with differentiated cancers. Um, uh, and so, you know, this was an example of a paper that was published uh, at MD Anderson. I think it's been about 15, 17 years ago now. And it was about using postoperative radiation therapy for advanced medullary thyroid cancer. Um, and so um, I would just say that... <clears throat> that uh, uh, 
I sort of show this to sort of as some historical context and just to show how things have really changed. Um, so, um, and I'm gonna skip ahead to, um, in, in 2011, as, as everybody in this group knows, there's really a couple of systemic, good systemic therapies that became available for medullary thyroid cancer that were FDA approved, Vandetinib and, and Cavozantinib, and, and many of you uh, remain on those drugs, and those are still very good drugs for medullary thyroid cancer. But that sort of changed the, the landscape of how we think about the disease, um, because um, no longer do we just have surgical um, options, but we also have these systemic therapy options, which um, are good um, for distant disease. So many of you who uh, may be on these drugs may be on it because you have metastasis in your lungs or your liver or your bones. But um, if you do have any residual disease in your neck, microscopic or otherwise, these drugs would also be treating that. Um, and they could also be used specifically for, for neck disease if it, were, if it were necessary. So that sort of changed the landscape of, of how we look at the big picture in terms of patients with medullary thyroid cancer, in terms of how we look at local regional control versus, versus distant disease. Um, and so it's not letting me um, move the slides again. Uh, there we go. So, um, so when we looked back at the um, 2015 uh, ATA guidelines for the management of MTC, um, there was a lot of, there, there, even then, that was only eight years ago when that was published, but the guidelines are always lagging behind sort of what the current evidence and the clinical practice is. So there was a lot of um, discussion in those guidelines um, about indications for uh, radiation therapy, including microscopic, you know, residual disease, extra thyroidal extension, extensive lymph node metastasis, which those are, we see those fairly common in medullary thyroid cancer patients, and yet we don't give those patients radiation therapy in 2023. Um, there really has been a general trend away from radiation to the neck, and I want to be very clear that we still use radiation therapy very often for, um, for bone disease, so for patients who have um, metastasis to their bones, you know, especially spine. Um, we use it very, very commonly for that. Also for mediastinal disease, disease that's um, in the mediastinum, it's very reasonable to, uh, to use radiation for that, although surgery can also be considered. Um, you know, there's, um, we have very good thoracic surgeons these days who could do thoroscopic procedures to remove uh, mediastinal lymph nodes. So, so that is something that, um, um, when you're talking about the mediastinal lymph nodes, you have to sort of think about um, sort of the, you have to weigh both surgery and radiation. But what I'm specifically talking about here is surgery to the neck. And so I, there's, there's really been a general trend away from radiation, except um, if you have a, a, an older patient with disease that's invasive of the esophagus or, or laryngotracheal complex. Um, there's very few patients, um, I think in 2023, that were met recommending radiation to the neck. Oh, Stephen, go ahead. Oh, great, thank you. Um, I very much appreciate listening. I, I thought I would just ask a quick question. Um, I'm very new to this. My story is that I was diagnosed with medullary thyroid cancer uh, two months ago through an incidental finding uh, on a carotid artery ultrasound. Um, I had a full thyroid, a total thyroidectomy and a neck dissection uh, at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York on September 19th. So I'm three and a half weeks out from that procedure. I'm happy to say healing great, but the, the nodule of my right thyroid. Uh, so I had 21 on the right side and uh, eight in the central compartment of my neck. Um, all of the lateral nodes tested negative. The ones eight in the central compartment tested positive. Uh, which I was told was fairly common in terms of that regional spread. Prior to surgery, I had gone through uh, extensive CT scans and MRIs with contrast to see if there was any distant metastasis. And thankfully, uh, the, the case was no. Everything was, was clean elsewhere. My question is really, um, I'm scheduled for my first blood work to test calcitonin levels and CEA levels uh, at the end of October. But I'm um, I'm aware of the percentage of times that this does recur. 
And I'm interested in um, what that recurrence typically looks like, where it would appear and how it's treated over time. And then the last thing I'll say is that I am currently awaiting uh, genetic testing and blood test results to see if this is a case of uh, hereditary MTC or sporadic, and we'll obviously uh, do do uh, what's necessary based on those results. I had a, a genetic mutation of the RET gene present in the in the nodule, so obviously that's now what's being tested to see if that's uh, in 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 my blood. But really, that's my story and where I sit right now. Um, I'm 58 years old, by the way, if that means anything. Um, and uh, I just have a very positive outlook. And, you know, the only thing that's certain in life is uncertainty. So um, I intend to uh, just keep living day by day and being as strong as I can possibly be. But I just was looking for some feedback on recurrence from you, if you might share. Yeah, well, Stephen, thanks so much for sharing uh, your story. That's a um, uh, thank you very much. And we sort of will be um, keeping you in our thoughts and prayers as you go forward with your um, your treatment. Um, sounds like you're uh, you just finished a, a surgery three and a half weeks ago. So congratulations on getting through that step. I know you're still healing from that. Um, from what I could understand, um, you had some central lymph node metastasis, but no lateral neck lymph node metastasis um, on the final pathology. Um, I think um, the recurrence risk um, going forward, um, you mentioned that you're getting uh, your calcitonin and I'm, I'm assuming CEA rechecked uh, in October. And typically um, roughly around three months after surgery, uh, we, um, we recommend rechecking calcitonin and CEA just to sort of reestablish a new baseline. So, um, you know, everybody has a certain level of calcitonin and CEA before their surgery, but then you can sort of, you get, the, you get a new baseline of, of calcitonin and CEA after the surgery. And, um, certainly, you know, the, the absolute best result is what's called a biochemical cure where, um, where three months after, you have the surgery, um, you, your calcitonin and CEA are zero or, you know, or normal in the, in the, what well, less than calcitonin, less than five CEA, you know, less than two or three. And so, you know, if you, if you do, or one of the patients that has a biochemical cure, um, then your chances of recurrence are much lower than, um, if you have, calcitonin and CEA, um, your new baseline three months after surgery, where it's still elevated. Um, and so um, if it's still elevated, that, that means that you do still have some calcitonin, I mean, excuse me, that you do, you do still have some medullary thyroid cancer in your body. Um, and, you know, so, so that would just be a matter of time, so to speak, until that may uh, become more apparent. But, you know, one of the things about medullary thyroid cancer is it's not um, uniform. And this goes for all types of thyroid cancer, papillary, anaplastic. I mean, it's, they don't all behave the same. Um, so, you know, many med medullary thyroid cancers are very indolent, um, meaning they grow very slowly. Many of them um, uh, uh, being indolent. And then a few of them, though, are not, and they grow more quickly and they're a little bit more aggressive. So um, even when you get that baseline, um, calcitonin CEA, you know, if it's elevated, um, and suggesting that you do have some residual medullary thyroid cancer in your, in your body somewhere. Um, that's not the whole story. It requires following that over a period of months and years to really see what that calcitonin and CEA are doing. Is that how quickly it's rising? And so you start to look at, um, you start to look at a doubling time at that point, a calcitonin or a CEA doubling time, you know, and the longer the doubling time, the longer it takes for that calcitonin or CA to double, the better, because um, that suggests that the tumor is more is, is excuse me is less biologically aggressive and um, is slower growing. So, so your your risk of recurrence is going to be constantly being reassessed and sort of change um, as we go. The next sort of point when you're going to get information is going to be at that post-operative baseline, which is three months after surgery. Um, and if you have a biochemical cure, then your, your, your risk of recurrence goes way down. 
But if you don't have a biochemical cure that would suggest that you know you, you you still have disease, then it's in terms of when that disease is going to show up, so to speak, um, uh, it's very variable. And um, over time, as you start to see how quickly that calcitonin and CEA are rising, then that gives you an indication of the the aggressiveness of the disease. Um, and um, so if you if you have residual calcitonin or CEA after surgery, I mean, the disease certainly could, could be still, you could still have some disease in your neck. Um, but more commonly, I would say you, you would have probably residual disease um, elsewhere in your body, you know, in the lungs or the liver. And again, it's, um, you know, our goal with medullary thyroid cancer these days is really to, um, uh, certainly we want to cure um, uh, as many patients as we can. And, uh, you know, surgery um, is one way that we can cure some patients. That's, that's true. Um, you know, if, if we get to it surgically before it's spread to other areas of the body, then, then technically surgery can cure it. Um, but um, for many patients, if not most, um, you know, by the time that we are able to do surgery, the disease is already spread. And so then it's more about, it becomes more of a chronic disease. Um, so which... Um, it is a frustrating thing, but it's also not the worst thing in the world because if we can, if we can turn it into a chronic disease that we can live with for a long time, then that's a win. Um, and so um, we have many, many patients who we follow for years and decades with medullary thyroid cancer that is, we know is there. They've got a calcitonin that's elevated, a CEA that's elevated. Sometimes we don't even see it on the imaging for a while, or if it's there on the imaging, um, sometimes we don't treat it right away. There's, you know, so, um, but um, um, whereas when it starts to grow on the imaging, um, that's when you would need to step in and treat it with drugs or, um, or other therapies. So um, it's really hard to, to give you an exact recurrence risk without sort of um, that's the, you know, further information about, um, about, you know, about, uh, about your particular case and, and really looking at that, that calcitonin CEA, you know, three months after surgery, which will, will help us a lot with that. So I hope that helps answer that somewhat. I can get back to that um, uh, in a few minutes if you have another question about it. Um, so um, what, what we were describing here, the... Um, the sort of our experience with neck radiation for medullary thyroid cancer, and, and I should probably put on the title, this is neck radiation. So this is the proportion of patients receiving neck radiation from 93 to 2019. And you see it's significantly decreased as, you know, so that such that even like in 2018, 2019, and I think this trend is going to continue even more that we don't have any patients who we're treating with radiation to the neck. I mean, there may be one every couple of years, but it's really becoming less and less and less um, that we use neck radiation for medullary thyroid cancer. And so um, this is a little bit of a complicated slide. I'm not going to go through it too much, but it, it basically breaks down our patients who were radiated into a pre-2013 and a post-2013 era and describing sort of their, their, their sort of uh, disease risk here, stratification, whether it be low, moderate, or high, whether they, they got radiation, and there's obviously a, a huge difference there. So, um, and these are, you know, some examples of patients who um, have more recently presented with disease in their neck, which is, you know, very bulky, and, um, and we can get this disease, you know, these are, this is all lymph, lymph node disease here, we can get this disease out um, surgically, and we, we typically, uh, here's another example of bulky lymph node and central and superior mediastinal disease even, um, we can get that out surgically, and we typically um, don't recommend radiation, even for patients who present with local regionally advanced medullary thyroid cancer. So I wanted to speak, I have about probably 15 more minutes left, and then we'll have plenty of time, I think, for questions. Um, so. Uh, a little bit about the mutational landscape of medullary thyroid cancer. Um, about 60% of it is RET mutated, um, whether it be hereditary or sporadic. Um, there's about 10, 15, 20%, I'd say probably 15 or 20 is probably the best number 
uh, here in this slide is 12%, but let's say 15% that's RAS mutated and um, another, you know, 30% that is neither, um, 25 to 30% that's neither RET nor RAS mutated. So there's been, um, uh, many of you here probably have a RET mutated cancer, but for the few of you who don't, you probably uh, feel left out of the conversation often because, because there's been so much talk recently in the last five years, six years about the RET specific inhibitors and, and how great it's been. And it has really been, it's been great and revolutionizing for how we treat medullary thyroid cancer. But I wanted to just speak before we talk about the RET specific inhibitors and some things we're doing around surgery for patients who have RET mutations. Uh, I wanted to speak a little bit about this group that's 40% of patients who are um, not RET mutated. So there's, there's a couple of drugs that um, have been FDA approved. I mentioned earlier, cabozantinib, vandetinib for, um, for patients who have um, uh, medullary thyroid cancer. And these can be for patients who have RET mutations or not. They can be for any medullary thyroid cancer. These are more uh, sort of uh, generalized drugs, cabozantinib and vandetinib. Um, so, and they work, um, they work well. I mean, this is a, 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 um, a study that was done, this was published 10 years ago, that was looking at the patients who got the drug cabozantinib versus those who did not get it. And there's a big difference in the, in the progression-free survival. Um, this drug cabozantinib does tend to have um, uh, a little bit more side effects than what we see uh, with the with the RET specific inhibitors. You know, there's 80% of patients on the drug in this study had dose reductions. 15% um, had to stop the drug. So, um, so we do um, we do see um, uh, you know quite a few patients who have side effects with 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 these drugs. Um, one of the things that one of the mechanisms of action of these drugs, cabozantinib and vandetinib, is they are VEGF mediated. Um, so they work against the uh, vascular endothelial uh, growth factor um, uh, uh, in the, the, uh, the VEGF receptor. And so that's one of the ways that, um, that uh, medullary thyroid cancer um, works and spreads is, it, um, is the overexpression of this vascular endothelial growth factor and vascular, vascular endothelial growth factor receptor. And so some of the drug targets um, target the, these particular expression of these, which can, um, is why the drug actually works. Um, so um, when, you, when you look at specific drugs like cabozantinib and vandetinib, which are FDA approved for medullary thyroid cancer, um, you see that, um, that a lot of it is this sort of, um, it's not the red, it's not the, um, um, some of these others that you do see some VEGF receptor, you see a little bit of blue there. So they, they do target the VEGF receptor. And then there's other kinases that, that are targeted too. Whereas, um, uh, and this, this shows the activity for vandetinib and cabozantinib against the VEGF receptor, uh, receptor one and receptor two, um, which is quite high when you compare it to, you know, even other drugs that are used for thyroid cancer, like lenvatinib and serafinib, which are FDA approved for differentiated thyroid cancer. So it has st very strong activity against this VEGF uh, receptor. And um, you know that, that does contribute to the side effects and also can lead to some concern around uh, fistulas and bleeding and such with surgery. There's even a black box warning on the, on the, um, the co cometric um, drug in that regard. But I, I wanted to give some hope for patients who are, who are in this non-RET mutated category, just to say that um, we are looking at other drug options for patients um, uh, who um, have non-RET mutated medullary thyroid cancer. So there's a company that we're looking at, and I won't mention the drug or the company because it's, we're still in the development phases of this clinical trial, which hopefully will go forward. But this is gonna be, we're looking at a clinical trial for local regionally advanced differentiated thyroid cancer and non-RET mutated medullary thyroid cancer, also poorly differentiated thyroid cancer. And it's a new um, TKI monotherapy that we are going to um, assess. Um, and we're gonna use it as a, as a preoperative treatment for patients who present with local regionally advanced disease. 
before they have surgery for, for these tumors, including not red mutated medullary thyroid cancer. Um, but it will also, this drug will also be able to be used, um, we think likely um, for patients with um, distant metastasis, those who are um, maybe on cabozantinib or vandentinib for medullary thyroid cancer. And so it's something that's coming uh, down, the, down the pipeline and, and we're excited about it. And we hope that um, this study and others will, um, will demonstrate um, efficacy for it and hopefully um, a, a, a better side effect profile uh, than what we see um, with the cabozantinib and vandentinib because it's sort of a, a second generation um, drug of, of cabozantinib. So, um, so that's, um, yeah, go ahead. Yes. So if I heard you correctly, um, this new drug is for people possibly who have new diagnoses who haven't had surgery. And then is this correct? If you have had surgery? Well, yeah. So for this particular clinical trial that we proposed, um, so um, I'm just showing the schema for, because I proposed this clinical trial to the company. So I have this, this is, um, but there are other clinical trials that will be done too. This but will not be the only one. Um, so this is a particular clinical trial looking at patients who would be getting this prior to surgery. There will be other clinical trials that will be looking at it for, for example, for patients who, um, who have distant metastatic disease. Um, so, so, but for, for the particular clinical trial that I would be leading, it would be more for patients who would be newly diagnosed, um, or it, they wouldn't have to be newly diagnosed. They could have recurrent neck disease, and this could be a way to treat them up front with drug therapy prior to surgery that would, that would help, help make the surgery easier and, and more, more effective. So from a patient perspective, that's super exciting. Um, but then if you've already had surgery, sure. um, at what point for people who've already gone through their, their first surgery and they're concerned about recurrence, does, do these, at what point do our surgeons introduce these drugs? Do you do it in conjunction with more surgery or in lieu of more surgery? How does that work? Yeah, well, that's a good question. It, it depends a lot on the situation. I mean, um, for the most part, um, for, 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 for most people who I would say who have surgery, a neck surgery for medullary thyroid cancer, this is not the case for all, but most of them um, should just have one surgery, okay? So if they're requiring a second surgery at some point in their neck, um, that is, there's, that's a unique situation in some way. Um, I'm not, you know, there's could be multiple different reasons for that in terms of, uh, but there's, there's going to be unique sort of, um, particulars to that case as to why they would need a second surgery. It could be, could be as simple as they had a thyroid central neck surgery 10 years ago, and now they have a lateral neck lymph node. And so that area was never dissected. And so they need a lateral neck dissection. That would be a very simple reason for that. You wouldn't need a drug in that type of situation because you would just do the lateral neck surgery, right? So um, for many patients who, um, uh, you know, would be having a second surgery, um, they, they may not need a drug up front. It would depend on the particulars of the situation. Now, if they had a surgery that was maybe, um, I mean, you know, for example, a surgery that was done by a less experienced surgeon and maybe they they did what they could, but they, they, they weren't able to um, really effectively remove the disease and they needed a second surgery, that could be a situation where you could use the drug to sort of, um, to sort of shrink down that tumor and, and get it um, to a better place um, while sort of giving more time you know, to let everything sort of heal and settle down. So most of the time when we're thinking about a schema like this, we're thinking about patients who have not had surgery yet but you could use it in patients who've had surgery if they had residual sort of bulky disease in their neck where they needed a second surgery. Um, if, if you're looking at a situation where uh, you're looking at a patient who has something small in their neck that comes up years after surgery and they just need a focal surgery to, to remove that, you're not gonna be using a drug in that situation. So that's, um, that's uh, kind of a 
good question and hopefully that helped answer it. All right. So I have about six, seven more minutes of slides and we'll have time for, for many more questions, I think. Um, so, um, so for those of you that do have retin-mutated tumors, you're familiar with the uh, FDA approval of these RET-specific inhibitors in 2020 for, um, for RET-mutated um, um, medullary thyroid cancer. And in this, um, uh, you know, you're probably also aware that, that the um, developers of Prelcetinib have now pulled this FDA indication. So really the only drug that's going to be primarily used going forward is going to be the sulfocatinib. Um, so if you've been on Prelcetinib, um, uh, probably, ultimately, you're probably going to be switching to the sulfocatinib. But these, these both have been um, very effective drugs uh, and really have changed the landscape for patients who have RET mutations. And so, um, so these, when you look at the particulars of um, of this drug, it's really specific to the, if you see the green there, that's really a, that's a RET um, uh, specific um, area that the drug uh, uh, targets. Um, so um, uh, it, it, um, it's very potent, not only against RET mutations, but also against other types of cancers that have RET fusions. They can be lung cancers, they can be um, other types of thyroid cancers. Um, so this was the, ESMO is a European Society of Medical Oncology 2022 update that um, this was uh, this was presented last year. The ESMO 2023 is actually going on like right now. So they'll probably have another update, but I don't have the slide from that yet. So really showing really good efficacy of these drugs. Um, you know, when you look at sort of the, um, the tumor shrinkage here that you get in a patient who, um, this is a pa these are patients who've never been previously treated. Um, you know, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 percent shrinkage of tumor um, with these drugs. And then even for patients who've been on previous cabozantinib or vandetinib, you still see further significant shrinkage. So um, these, I mean, I think these, you know, the sulfurcatinib, the RET-specific inhibitor is really becoming first line for patients who have RET-specific um, medullary thyroid cancer. And in this slide just kind of shows um, the, the tumor markers, the CEA and the calcitonin, you see these dramatic drops, you know, calcitonin drops, you know, but usually between 90 and, uh, and 90 and 99%, you see these huge drops in calcitonin uh, when you get on the drug. Now, I'll show later, um, that it's not all to the story because if you get off the drug, this calcitonin will start, will start rising again over time. So it's, um, it's not like this tumor has just completely gone away. It's, it's really, you know, keeping that tumor at bay is what it's doing. Um, so, and these drugs tend to be pretty well tolerated um, as opposed to the data we showed er earlier for cabozantinib. Fewer patients have to dose reduce or discontinue the drug. You know, we showed 80% uh, of cabozantinib patients had to dose reduce, whereas 30% of sulfocatinib. So, so it's, it's a little bit easier, um, not that it's completely easy because it's, it still has side effects. And um, fatigue and, you know, some of these other side effects are real and it's not that it's without side effects, but relatively they're a little bit, it's a little bit better tolerated. So we, we started to look at uh, um, this using for patients who present with local regionally advanced medullary thyroid cancer using neoadjuvant sulfurcatinib prior to surgery. So we published our first uh, experience with this about three years ago now, really showed a significant amount of tumor shrinkage in the neck that really allowed us to do um, effective um, surgery here. And then we published a second paper uh, about a year and a half ago, looking at more patients. These were all MTC patients who had red altered thyroid cancer that we, we treated up front with the RET specific inhibitor. And we see the pictures on the left are the pre-treatment and the pictures on the right are the post-treatment. We see um, quite a bit of shrinkage of these tumors that um, then allowed us to, um, to do um, effective surgery. And what we think is surgery with potentially de decreased uh, morbidity. And so this is a current clinical trial that we have. This is our whole sort of team working on it um, across. Um, uh, it's open in four centers now. We're about to open a fifth um, center. Um, this, you know, I think this is mostly medullary thyroid cancer patients in here, but, but this this also, um, this sort of strategy works for patients who have 
papillary thyroid cancer who have red fusions. Um, again, about 10, five to 10% of papillary thyroid cancers are gonna have red fusions, even occasional anaplastics, it's not very common have ret fusion, so, so these drugs can also be used for that. And this is ret fusion positive thyroid cancer, papillary, poorly differentiated, anaplastic. And you see these drugs work very well for those patients as well. And so these are the sites that we currently have um, open. In addition to MD Anderson, we've opened three other sites and Toronto is, uh, is hopefully opening in the near future. So we did an interim analysis um, looking at our first 14 patients who um, we treated with this approach, um, we were able to, um, 13 to 14 patients ended up having surgery after six cycles of the drug, which translates to about six months of being on the drug. Um, and um, uh, most of those had what we call an R0 resection, meaning uh, margins are negative, although some still had a R1, meaning microscopically positive margins. Um, and 10 of those, the original 13 have remained off sulpercatinib. Three have had to go back on sulpercatinib post-surgery. Um, and um, uh, so this just goes to show you sort of sulpercatinib. This was an example of a patient, you know, who um, came in with a, a, uh, a calcitonin of 16, 17,000, went on sulpercatinib, their calcitonin dropped down to, you know, a couple of hundred. Um, stopped the, um, uh, um, or sorry, had surgery, uh, uh, the um, calcitonin went down even a little bit more. And then we took the patient off of the um, uh, sulpercatinib after surgery. And then you see the, the, the calcitonin went up. And so it started out at 17,000. I think, you know, here it goes back up to, you know, around 9,000. So um, and then when we restarted the sulpercatinib, then you see it goes back down here. So, um, so for, for patients who have more aggressive distant disease, you know, this, this strategy of using the sulpercatinib prior to surgery um, is not, it's not going to prevent those patients from ever needing to go back on the drug again. Again, you know, several of these patients, three had to restart the sulpercatinib pretty quickly after surgery. But, but for other patients, they are able to remain off the drug for, um, for uh, a period of months to years. Um, and then eventually, as they um, are, are needing it for distant disease, they would, they would go back on it. So um, I'm going to skip over these slides and this slide because I, in the interest of time. But Yeah, we have um, about seven minutes left. Yeah. So um, for that, I, I'm going um, to go to my last slide just because I want to leave... Um, time for questions. So uh, some of the points that we've been over, we, we don't do elective surgery for ultrasound negative um, lateral necks for patients who present with medullary thyroid cancer. There's a very narrow role for, for neck radiation. Um, we're excited about the effective targeted systemic therapies, cabozantinib, bandetinib, sulpercatinib, and then even new tyrosine kinase inhibitors that we're studying um, for the RET um, negative um, medullary thyroid cancers. And we do use this neoadjuvant approach with targeted therapy prior to surgery for our patients with the most local regionally advanced. And um, that's it. I'll, uh, I'll take the next seven, 10 minutes to answer questions. Hi, thank you. Hello. Yeah. I have a question about your new phase two, the TKI monotherapy that you're talking about. Sure. Um, is that one of those that you would think it's not that, has not been approved by the company? Oh right, yet. right. I know. So it's that's why I didn't mention. That right. I'm just yet. I'm wondering if that all happens. Is that a drug that the patient would have to stay on for life? Also, kind of like the. It depends on the circumstances, right? So, for as a surgeon looking at patients who present with local regionally advanced disease, we can use the drug to shrink down the. The, sur the shrink down the tumor significantly, make our surgery better and easier. And then, um, and then they can go off the drug after surgery. Now that doesn't, many of these patients who have local regionally advanced disease also have distant disease. So that doesn't mean that at some point in their life, they wouldn't need to start the drug for their distant disease. And it would be similar, all of these drugs would be similar in the sense that none of these drugs at this point no drug we have for medullary thyroid cancer is curative, right? So it's not like any of these drugs we can treat you for a couple of months and say, okay, then you're off of it. 
um, uh, and this drug would be the same. It would be, uh, so I think that's what you're getting at with the question. Um, you would have to, in order to see the benefit of that drug, you'd have to stay on it. Yeah. Yes. Of those 30% that had to reduce their dose for um, Loxo. Um, yes. Did possibly, could, if one of them had the reduced dose, could they ever be raised? I mean, you sure. Yeah. I mean, you can, you can drop dose of these drugs and then raise it back up. Um, Re-challenge re a patient, so to speak, if they uh, are doing better. I mean, it also depends on what's happening clinically. If you lower the dose because of side effects, and then they the patient continues to do okay in terms of you know the disease still being controlled, you may not have a reason to bring it back up. But if the disease, you know, at some point, um, for most types of targeted therapy, we don't have enough long-term data for the selpercatinib yet to really understand how many patients will develop drug resistance and how long that will take, you know, that's going to take five to 10 years to really understand that. Um, uh, as we get more follow-up data, we'll, we'll have a better understanding of, of the percentage of patients who may develop resistance, meaning they may start progressing on the drug and how long that takes. But right now we don't really have a good, good um, understanding because we don't have enough patients who've been on it long-term. Well, no, so, so even, even, even when these trials finish, I mean, it doesn't mean you stop collecting the data. Patients will stay, patients stay on these drugs. Um, you continue to collect data. Uh, so yeah, so we'll, we'll continue to collect that data. Uh, Dr. Zavario, uh, do you anticipate future protocols trending towards mm. use of drugs pre-surgery to make the surgery easier and reduce morbidities? I think so. I think for local regionally advanced patients who present with um, local regionally advanced disease, yes, I think that's going to be, because it's not only a trend in medullary thyroid cancer, it's in other anaplastic cancers, even more in anaplastic than medullary, but, um, but in other cancers as well, uh, other thyroid cancers that are aggressive. Uh, in the Facebook group, you know, everyone knows about the Facebook group. Um, we strongly advocate people to get to a center of excellence and remind people that, you know, we aren't doctors on the Facebook group, so we shouldn't be giving medical advice. Um, but kind of the current thinking is to tell people who've had lob lobectomies that the standard of care is a central neck surgery. And um, we're pretty vocal about that as a group. So um, what this person asked is they hear you saying lobectomies may, may be appropriate in a case by case basis. Uh, is that new? Is that emerging research we should be more aware of? Should we, as a group, sort of make that um, option more well-known? So, um, yeah, so I think if what I would say, um, it, yeah, so it depends on the, it's, it's uh, this is an area that needs to continue to be studied. Um, I would say the standard of care is still a total thyroidectomy and a central neck surgery. Um, for, um, but when you, um, when you have a patient who presents with sporadic medullary thyroid cancer, um, it's confined to the thyroid gland, um, certainly um, you can consider a lobectomy and a unilateral central compartment dissection. If you're going to do the lobectomy, I would definitely advocate for doing the unilateral central compartment dissection on that side at the same time, because you don't want to ever have to go back to that same side. If it's tumors on the left, for example, you would do the take out the left half of the thyroid and the left central compartment lymph nodes so that, you know, if you had to go back on the right years later because there was a lymph node or something over there that you had to remove, that would be um, easier than having to go back on the left side where there would, had already been surgery. So um, I think it's something to be aware of. Um, I, I think it's dependent on the situation. I mean, if you have an 80-year-old lady who has a sporadic MTC and it's two centimeters, uh, I would definitely do a lobectomy on that patient. So um, because, um, you know, that, so it, it really depends on the, I should say lobectomy in a central compartment. It depends on the full gamut of the situation, but we are starting to talk to patients about that in particular situations. Thank you. 
Um, and with that, we are out of time. And I'm really sorry that we didn't get to some of the questions. There was one question about um, voice issues. And I will say that the next session, 232, is actually called Surgical Complications, Voice Issues, and Other Problems. So if you have questions about voice issues, definitely attend that one. Um, I want to thank Dr. Zafario so much for coming to give a presentation today. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.